And welcome back to Getting Started with PowerShell Desired State Configuration. I'm one of your hosts, Jason Helmick, joined by the distinguished engineer and lead architect, Jeffrey Snover. And now it's time for us to get into the deep side of DSC. So here's what we're going to start out with, just to let you see the where we're at in our course module selection page, is we are on module two performing a push deployment. We're going to take you through the steps of doing a deployment, and we're going to do a straightforward push deployment that we're going to talk about. But you know, Jeffrey, I was going to save this for later, but we're yep. getting a lot of questions in chat. And by the way, guys, keep asking questions. That's what the whole fun part is. So join with us. Um, so when we think about desired state configuration, we're saying, okay, we're going to have a configuration that servers can we could either push it to them or they could pull these configurations. It's going to configure these boxes. And people are asking, well, first of all, it's kind of sounding like I'm just sending out a group policy. Mm -hmm. Yep. Or, and we can talk about the SCCM stuff, the System Center Configuration Manager, but, you know, this is what SCCM does, or this is what group policy does. Talk a little bit about those products in line with DSC. Yeah, so actually part of the, the inspiration came from uh, my reaching out to uh, people using uh, Windows in a cloud environment. And they were trying to use those technologies, and it just really wasn't working with them for them. So, for instance, with group policy, they try and make a change. And they say, "But I got to know that it's happened, right? <laughs> and I got to know that it happened when it happened. You know, I got to." And so, you know, the the kind of looseness just didn't work. And so, whether it was group policy or the SCCM, basically, it was uh, trying to solve very similar problems, but did wasn't doing it in a way that was really meeting our server customers' needs. And in particular, this DevOps mindset of, again, if you read the book, you'll see how this is very clear, but you want to be able to state what you want, you want to be able to have a repeatable process, you want to have a fine degree of control over what happens when, uh, and so that's why we invented Desired State Configuration. And I think one of the, one of the other key, key points that really kind of drilled it in for me is, is at first, when I, when I had first seen you and Kenneth Hansen, show everybody desired state configuration. First thought in my head was, seems like group policy, and I, I had said something like, seems like a better group policy, and I think you or Kenneth had said, yeah, but you don't have to be a part of Active Directory. Yeah. And it was like the first moment where I had to think this through. Oh, wait a minute, a Unix box, or some of the other things that we're gonna show that aren't part of Active Directory, DSC can take care of. So yeah. this is that cross-platform. So let, let's talk about one of the other things the DevOps guys talk about, and that is uh, simplicity. Okay? What they say is that uh, one of the problems is when managing large-scale systems is that scale times complexity exceeds our skill set. Okay? So if you want to scale, and that's the goal, that's what success looks like to these cloud guys, right? Scale, success. Um, if you have complexity, you can't do it. Okay, so things have to be very, very simple. And so you see PowerShell DSC is extraordinarily simple. Now simple is not a term typically associated with group policy. It's very powerful, right. deals with lots of edge cases, you know, great tool for what it is, but it's not a simple tool and therefore is not a good fit for DevOps scenarios. In fact, let's start to utilize this tool so you understand where we're coming from and where these conversations are emanating from. We're going to start with module number two, performing a push deployment. Now, we did this as the very first demo was actually a push deployment, but now you get a chance to write scripts along with us and work with us. Remember, you're going to want the WMF5 February preview to follow along. So let's take a look at our module overview. We're going to talk very briefly because we've already been talking about it for the purpose of a push deployment. We're going to get right into how do you actually write a declarative DSC configuration. And then we're going to talk more about the local configuration manager. And we're going to talk about this special thing called MOF, the management object file. And, and then we'll do the actual push deployment. And so, first of all, we've already talked about the purpose to do this. This is great for testing. It's great for uh, lab environments. Doing a push deployment, it's great for uh, uh, educate, you know, single machine, I need to do this. But really, this module, what we want to focus on is start to introduce everybody into how to write this. And one of the, the most interesting things is, is you had said this two years ago. You made a promise to everybody and I, told, I tell everybody all the time, I'm going to hold him to that promise and see what happens. You promised everybody that you said, if you learn, I'm going to make a contract with you. If you learn PowerShell, that's all you're going to need. Yep. And so when DSC came out, I'm like, oh, God, another language I'm going to have to learn. 
And the answer is no. We do this in PowerShell, right? Exactly. Exactly. So when we do this in PowerShell, let me get to my uh, particular little screen here. When we do this in PowerShell, um, this is uh, uh, kind of strange. If you hey, before you do that, oh, can yeah, we yeah. switch to mine? Oh, sure, I sure. Show them something. Okay, so let's switch to mine. So notice here, right? So I've got PowerShell version five installed, right? The uh, MVA. And what I did was I said find module MVA pipe to install module. Okay. So now that's how you go. Went to the repository, found that. And so now if I say get module minus list MVA, you see I've got my two two modules here. Okay, and so then there's stuff like initialize DSC. Okay, so we're gonna do that. Well, actually, let's do this. Say show MVA DSC examples minus day one, because it's two days, oh, minus that's module. What module are we on? We're on module two. Okay. <gasps> ah. And there. And notice it says use clear MVA DSC examples when done. Well, so it'll clean that up. Well, that's much cooler than me flipping to my... That's awesome. There you go. This is why you want to one get, PowerShell get, you want to have the PowerShell get, yeah. So do what he just said so you can get all this. So now we're going to talk about building this. This is really very similar. If you've ever worked with, uh, well, I'm sure you have, if you've made an advanced function. You know, advanced functions, you can you set mm. them up, create them, you can put parameters, stuff like that in them. So this is kind of interesting. This is actually, we're going to start off really simple, but this is very similar, right? Yep. So, so I, I'm going to put in a keyword here, and, I, and so everybody take a look here. I'm going to put in this keyword called configuration just to kind of show the structure. What does this keyword mean This is the, for us? I'm going to kind of put him in there, and I need to give him a name. Oh, IntelliSense. Control, space. Oh, it's not showing me the full... Syntax for some reason at the moment, but we'll get a name in here. Let's give him a name. Let's call him test config. So this configuration keyword is a new keyword, right, for yes. DSC. Yep. And it, instead of like function, which we had before, when we run this, what's this key? What's this new keyword going to do? So basically, for us? you want to think of it exactly like function. Okay. Okay. It defines a name function foo defines a name foo that then can be invoked. Okay. And it runs code. And it runs code. Okay, configuration is exactly the same thing. You define a name, in your case, what'd you call it? Test, Test config. config. Okay, it defines a name that can then be invoked and it runs code. The difference between a function and a config is that a config runs code whose job it is to produce a configuration, which is to say a configuration document. And so this code can run PowerShell code, but then there are special keywords, these resources that you'll declare, and when you declare them, PowerShell, underneath the covers, collects them all, organizes them, and then when you're done, outputs them to a series of files, these configuration files, that then you go and push. So again, high level, configuration is exactly like function, it defines a name, and when you invoke that name, code gets run. The only difference is this code generates documents. And we're going to show you this because this is one of the challenges that I had was understanding what, was, what these documents were. Let me show you the rest of the structure real quick. We'll show you the commandlets and we'll make this work. So the rest of the general structure for this for us to get started with is inside we have another keyword called node. And I'm going to specify one of the computer names that we have in our environment. And inside of this, this is what I want this computer to be configured with. And as Jeffrey mentioned, we will then start to use one of those resources that we saw earlier. And I'm just going to use one called... Windows feature, and this is what the structure is going to look like. So you can make yourself um, a template if you want. We're actually going to install a web server without knowing how to install a web server. So this structure, configuration, the node that you wanted to go to, and the feature that you want to use is a pretty straightforward structure for us. Now, let's go ahead and use that structure. First of all, a couple of things. We're going to take a look at get help here to find out the DSC commandlets that we need. And, and Jeffrey, we have a bunch of new ones in here. We're going to actually be showing you guys almost all of these as we go through here. Yep. Notice I've done get help uh, dash DSC. This will give you the commandlets that we're going to be working with um, in here. We also, in particular, are going to be working with the local configuration manager. So I've got something in that document, if you all have downloaded it, that will get you just the commandlets for the local configuration manager. Get DSC local configuration manager will tell us about its current settings and, of course, set 
we'll set those. And I want you guys to take a look here quick. And if Jeffrey, you want to talk to a couple of these, yep. um, we're going to take a look at Server One's Local Configuration Manager. And let me kind of bring this screen up a little bit so we can see some of these settings. And this is kind of interesting. Um, okay, we're going to be going through uh, several of these. But um, let's talk about this. Apply yes, and or go ahead and. Yeah, so uh, the, you know, provides a large, you know, nice, nice fine grained control over what's going on. There's a configuration mode. Okay, so configuration yes. mode, you can do things like uh, apply it, and that's it. Sort of like a one shot. Or apply and monitor. Applies it and then monitors, and then will tell you when things are out of sync. Or apply and auto correct. I forget the t yeah. terms. We have IntelliSense for that. <laughs> but there, it'll find things that are out of, of uh, sequence or out of uh, state, and then it will correct them and notify you if you can't. So then the question is, well, how often does it do there? And so there's some some um, things there about refresh. There the you go. The configuration mode frequency. Refresh frequency and in minutes. Yeah. Now here's an interesting thing. We used to think that uh, we tried to design this to be very, very efficient so that we could re, you know, reduce this frequency uh, time, you know, refresh frequency uh, very, very quickly, you know, so we could make it very, very quick. Turns out that that's not the model. When people use technologies like this, the idea is that you make all your changes through desired state configuration, and then you don't go to the box and start making, you know, changing the configuration. It's like bad, bad, bad. So, uh, and if someone does that, you detect it and will auto-correct it, and then you're notified. You're be able to tell when something went wrong. Well, it turns out, and so we were thinking, well, we'll try and detect the drift as quickly as possible and correct it as quickly as possible. It turns out that that's not how people actually use it. What happens is that once you get a system like this, um, that's the way you make changes. And this checking for drift and correcting it is really just checking and finding the people who don't know or aren't following the best practices. So you detect oh. that, you resolve it, and then you find out, hey, Jason, maybe you're not aware how we do things here. Let me explain. We don't do things. We don't make changes by going into the box and changing it. We go through this process, and we make the changes to the desired state configuration, and then we push it. So just stop do that. Stop touching the box. So stop touching the box, right. please. And then they follow that pattern. And so uh, then once people follow the pattern, the refresh cycle, they actually turn it down because it's really not needed. So it's really needed at the beginning to help detect when you have a training issue. This so is excellent. it's still needed, but right. it's, it's, it doesn't have to be like really, 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 really quick, which was not our, our intuition. So again, one of the benefits of talking to your users, because we had in our head, man, I, I want to do that every minute, every 30 seconds. Can I do it every five seconds? And they're like, no, don't do that. You just be consuming resources. So to, to kind of cap this off, because this is going to give us uh, some of the configurations we're going to start with, the configuration mode, apply, apply, monitor, and apply autocorrect. One of the things I think it's very important to realize is that you can apply the configuration and then just let it drift from there and or apply and monitor. Now you're getting information back when the drift occurs. So now you can do the corrections that Jeffrey was saying. Hey, look, we need to teach you how to, you know, how we're going to configure machines. You don't touch the box. Apply and autocorrect is when, okay, something has changed and we're going to reset it on that refresh yep. interval. And I think it's fascinating because I would have thought you would want to done right this minute, but no, you want some time so that you can still do that same process of correcting the human that's affecting that drift. Yep. I think that's awesome. So let's go ahead and let's bring up a couple of scripts that will allow us to configure the LCM. The LCM we can push scripts to, and I want to show you, you're going to see this on the internet, so I intentionally wanted to show you the old way of how one of these scripts might look. And I don't want to spend yep. a whole lot of time on it, but I want, want you to see some characteristic differences. So when PowerShell v4 and DSC came out, you would have a, you would write a configuration and give it a name, the node that you wanted to send it to, and then you would put in that you wanted to configure the local configuration manager. And we can start to change those particular properties, such as the configuration mode. I want him to apply and autocorrect. Now, this particular pattern, Jeffrey, has, has recently changed. Yes. Um, and if you are working with WMF5 out there, you should follow the change now, too. While this may be the old way you see it on the internet, let me bring up the new way, and maybe you can tell us why this changed, because I, I think this is fascinating. <laughs> because to a lot of people, this may not look all that different. Yeah. 
But if you take a look um, at this, we start off with this keyword right at the very top, DSC Local Configuration Manager. Why do we have to put that in? Uh, what's that do for me? So basically what this does is that you still do the same thing. You're defining a name. You, through the configuration keyword, you're defining a name of something that gets generated. Okay. Now, in the past, what you do, when, we, when you see all the details, you'll see that the configuration that gets generated is some node name dot moth. Okay. Now, that configures the machine. What we want to do is we want to configure the LCM agent on that machine. On that machine. So one way to think about this is what we call meta configuration. You configure the configuration management agent. <clears throat> okay, so it's meta configuration. Meta configuration. So you'll see when we run this, that tag at the top saying DSC local configuration manager says, when you run this name, instead of generating a MOF, generate a metadata dot MOF. MOF. And then that's pushed through a different mechanism. MOFs are generated and pushed through start DSC configuration. Metadata dot MOFs are pushed through set DSC local configuration manager. And we're going to talk more about what MOFs are and what's getting generated here. This also gives me um, a lot of IntelliSense features, yeah. right? So if you take a look at my screen, I wanted to just show you, I'm going to go down to configuration and uh, control space. And we get IntelliSense here for how to uh, make the configuration. One of the things is you give it a name. Inside, I've got a node and I have a variable here that I'm gonna to use to pass multiple computer names to, because we're gonna configure more than one LCM. And instead of the older keyword that was the local configuration manager, now it's called settings. So the new one up here, the settings here, and I'm gonna do those same settings. Down here, I want you to notice I'm setting the computer name to S1 and S2. Those are two virtual machines in our environment that haven't been touched. And now, as Jeffrey had mentioned earlier, treat it like a function. I'm gonna call this function and put the files that it generates, which we're gonna talk about here in just a minute, to that location. So all I'm gonna do is run this, and you'll see down here, it'll come up and tell me at the bottom, it created, oh yeah, s1.metamoff, what Jeffrey had just talked, this is the meta configuration for it. Let's go ahead and take a look oh, at wait, that. I realized oh, I, yeah, I missed the key part. Oh, and that is, as we've gone and, and listened to customers, uh, we found that there's additional scenarios that they want to do. Yeah. So I think tomorrow we talk about partial configurations? Yes. So partial configurations is an advanced scenario, and what it means is that the configuration uh, gets richer and richer. You know, the meta configuration gets richer and richer. I'll give you a slight preview. You might say, I want a partial configuration. Uh, these guys, can I, I have configuring the uh, uh, networking, and that's done through a pull service. These folks are, are configuring the application, and that's done through a push service. And so we that configuration at the beginning was very, very uh, limited, and now it gets richer. And so this tag allows us to uh, you know, address that more c coherently. And I, I, I love this concept of the partial configuration of saying, um, we want to take configurations from this machine from different folks and different people and get this machine configured, because that's probably what's going to happen for most of us mm -hmm. in real life. Uh, setup. Well, here, I, everybody take a quick look at my slide. We just created some MOF files. And this is kind of the, the part that I mentally was a little bit strange with at first. I'm writing stuff in PowerShell, and you're telling me that, well, what we're gonna do is that PowerShell is, in, is going to create these, these special files that are standards-based, and these are the files that hold the configuration that we're gonna send to those target systems. Correct. And the first thing in my brain is, hey, look, I've been writing it stuff in PowerShell and just sending the PowerShell commands to those remote systems. Why do, why do we have to convert this to this other layer, this MOF thing? What is this MOF thing? Okay, so again, being standards-based, here's the heart of it. The heart of it is you get this document. The, the, there's three parts of the model. There is the authoring tools that generates this ASCII text MOF file, and then you send that MOF file to a standards-based management agent. Now remember that standards-based management agent might be Windows, might be Linux, might be some third party's and agent. That's the thing I wasn't thinking about. I, I wasn't I was thinking, well, if you're just sending it to a Windows box, it's got PowerShell, just give it PowerShell. But this is architected to be able to do more than that. Exactly. And that ASCII text document, how did I get it? Now we're gonna show you two days worth of how you use PowerShell to generate that ASCII text document. But here's the deal. 
You can generate it any way you want. You can bring up Notepad and generate this document. <laughs> you can use Ruby or Python or Erlang or Scala, anything you want, anything that produces an ASCII text document, you can use to do this. So this is what we mean by a platform. There's more than one ways to do this. This is not coupled to PowerShell. So you produce this ASCII text document any way you want. You give it to a standards-based management agent, and then it goes and makes it so. Now then, we provide an experience on top of that, an inbox scripting experience on top of that, where we have PowerShell to make it easy to write that document. Because we're using the standards-based schema, we have our standards-based uh, uh, infrastructure, we have the schema for the resources. That allows IntelliSense and PowerShell to deliver an IntelliSense experience. You'll see some of the products in this space uh, don't use standards-based management, and so they have a hard time with schema. Right. Right? It's like, better type it right, my friend, because if you get it wrong, you're not going to know until you try and push it. Here, we can support standards-based you know, schema support, uh, so you can get IntelliSense and know a priori. You could produce this thing. We know whether that's a valid document or not before we push it to the machine. So you kept your promise. In other words, I can write everything in PowerShell, and now PowerShell is going to create this standards-based ASCII file that can go to heterogeneous systems. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Here's the next thing, though. I'm an IT pro. I'm about to show everybody what a moth looks like. Yeah. Do I have to know how to write and read moth? No. Not, not at all. Not at all. You do not need to know how to write or read a moth. Now, that said, and when you look at it, it looks just like Jason. So Jason's... <laughs> No, not you. Oh, me? I was like... No, it's good looking. It's bald and pudgy. <laughs> oh, no, it's good looking. Oh, okay. No, good Jason, day. Jason, J-S-O-N, Java something. Oh, JavaScript Jason, yeah. object, JavaScript uh, object no notation, yeah. Jason. Anyway, so that's very, very popular these days. If you take a look at Moff and you just kind of like cross your eyes a little bit, it looks just like Jason. You know, a little variation. So it's actually pretty readable. Uh, much more readable to my eyes. It's much more readable than XML. Uh, but still, and, and, and there are times when you might find it useful. So, for instance, you'll see. Can you show the slide again? Oh, yeah, I can show the slide again. Or, or a moth. Oh, here, I'll just bring up the moth for everybody. Let me bring up the moth, just Let me bring up the moth for everybody that we just generated right here. Because uh, look what it says. The, 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 you know, slash star, so there's comments. And we say target node, where it's going, generated by... Jason, Hello. when did it get generated? Where did it get generated? So we provide some information as you have a large system and you're like, wait, how did I get this thing? What, what, who? Okay, Jason, tell me. <laughs> On this day, what were you doing that you produced a document <laughs> like that? What were you doing, my what friend? What were you doing? <laughs> and uh, so it's, it's helpful from that perspective. But yeah, you do, in le learning, editing, uh, you know, reading, editing, MOF files is not a required skill at all. So here's something very important that I want to make sure we get out right now. While I have displayed a moth on the screen, I'm probably not going to show a moth again because we don't need to, do, to deal with the moth in most cases. So the moth gets generated for us. And I want to point out to you that, you know, we have a convert to JSON commandlet, right? We do. Yeah, it shaves your head, makes you a little pudgy. I like that. Oh, yeah. You so you've seen a moth. Now we're going to stop looking at the moth, but this is the file that's going to get sent to our target system to configure the LCM. So let me show you this. I'm going to go back to the demo, and we have a commandlet called set DSE local configuration manager. And so he's going to take that metamoth and send it to whatever computer we want. And I'm sending it to uh, dollar sign computer name, uh, which will send it to S1 and S2. And you know what? I just want to make sure real quick that it is going to send it to both of those. It would help if I could type. Uh, I'm just checking my variable real quick, S1 and S2. So let's go ahead and run that. Now, I want to point out that I've got this set up in verbose mode and the path to where those moth files were generated. Verbose will show us some additional information as it runs. And if we take a look, as we start to kind of look in here, it'll show us that it's invoking uh, the methods for it, the send methods, which we're not going to get a whole lot into those, but uh, it, it's sending it out to those machines. The LCMs report that they have received a call and that they are running their configurations, but let's go see what they look like. And remember, I was changing these to have a different configuration mode. Here, clear your screen first. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And we'll look at the what those LCMs now look like. And what I was setting them to was apply and autocorrect. And that's what I have for both 
S1 and S2. Now, Jeffrey, we're going to be doing stuff as we move throughout the series of the different configurations for the LCM. We're going to be looking at partial configurations, all that kind of stuff. But right now we've got an LCM configured. It's set to push so I can send it configuration documents. Yep. And I've changed it to apply and autocorrect. Let's see if we can have some fun with that. We're going to make a configuration document, and we're going to make one that's going to deploy a web server. I'm just so happy. Um, <laughs> it's weird. No. Nope. Um, so let's take a look. First of all, a couple of commandlets uh, in addition. Uh, Jeffrey's already shown you. Get DSC resource gives us a list. And right now, folks, I haven't put out all of the resources, all of the new ones, the X ones or the C ones intentionally. We'll be doing those later. One of the resources that is available that I want to use is called Windows Feature. And it's down here. And oddly enough, Windows Feature lets me install Windows features. Now, I want to explore this. <laughs> I know, it's almost, a, <laughs> this stuff almost writes itself. Now, I want to explore this. And so what I'm going to do here is, I have it in the examples for everybody, but one of the beautiful things that I love about commandlets that help me understand, I'm a guy, and I don't know what, what I don't know how to use this resource. So I'm going to go uh, take a look at Windows feature and select object. And I want to expand the properties called properties. And what this is going to show me are the things that I can use in this resource, except I obviously cannot type Windows, Windows feature. S. So I am going to use the one in the example that works. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, I just blew it up, too. Uh, wait a minute. No, it works fine. Uh, uh, yeah. Control Z. Z. There we go. Um, so this shows me the things that I can set using Windows features, the properties that are available. It also tells me whether they're mandatory. The thing that's mandatory oh, is... You know, do you know the pro way to do that? The pro way? Yeah. No, what's it, the pro way? Well, you have select object slash dash object slash expand property. Replace that with percent sign. Replace with what? Uh, percent. Do, Just select that and replace it with percent. This? Yeah, keep properties. Oh, keep properties and, just, and replace this, really, with yeah, a percent? Percent sign. I thought that meant for each. It does mean for each. Oh, I see what you're getting at. Okay, another way we could do this. So for you pros, right? You're going to learn a little That's PowerShell right. here. Too. Yeah, pros. Oh, much shorter to type in, yeah, right? It gives shorter. me the same stuff. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. It's less obvious, so it was great to see the fully expanded way. But when you're typing it, just yeah, sign. if you're typing it at the yeah, always go ahead and you know go short when you're typing it yourself. Um, so now I've, I've got these properties that I can use, but you know what I really need, Jeffrey, is, you know, the first time I started looking at resources, I'm like, gee whiz, guys, could you, like, give me a code sample? Like, and give it, me the syntax? Like, give me the syntax, and oddly <laughs> enough, Ask folks, take you a shall look, receive. you shall receive, and I think this is really very important. Um, so I'm going to run where Windows feature dash syntax, and that's the syntax that I need. Here's what's funny. You can actually just copy and paste this and fill it in. Or pipe it to clip. Or pipe it to clip. Or if you're using WMF 5, the February release, IntelliSense will help you with this. Yeah. So let's do that. Let's call up a simple configuration where I've already done that. And uh, let's see here. Dun, da, 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 and show you kind of what this looks like. So we would write configuration, the config name, whatever nodes we want it to go to. And I'm going to send it to S1 and S2. And here's Windows Feature. And I'm going to select Windows Feature, hit Control Space, and it will show me that syntax that we just looked at. So I could take a look and say, OK, well, I know that it doesn't have giant square, gi gi production guy, giant square, giant, gi gi production, giant square brackets. <laughs> around the name, which means it's mandatory. No square brackets, mandatory. Name is the name of the Windows feature that you want to install. I want to install a particular Windows feature. Real quick, let me show you how I found the Windows feature that I want. As a matter of fact, I'm just going to launch PowerShell here real quick. So servers have a command like get Windows feature. And you can list all the Windows features. These are all the roles and features that you can install with PowerShell. And what I want is a web server. Now, the server I'm running this on it currently does have a web server. The other two do oh, not. Oh, you're doing this the hard way. Do that. Run that again and pipe it to OGV. Oh, you want to do the o, the out grid view. Yeah. So we'll do so again. Learn learn out the techniques. Grid view. I just type OGV. So now you can now just search in the filter. Just type 
Like, no, 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 don't oh, do no, that. That's for structure. Just in the filter, just type uh, web. Web, bump, and, and here's web, web server. server. Now the name that we're gonna need is this hit, name. Hit control plus, because they can't see it. Oh, they can't see it. Control plus, control plus. Yeah, see, that's that cool. Awesome? That is cool. So web-server is the feature that I'm going to want to install. Taking all of that, let's go back to, here's where I've got name, feature, web-server. And this is a default, but I typed it in, ensure equals present. Yeah. This is one of the things in the configuration that we need to do with ensure. What does ensure it's present and absent. I know it sounds like it's too simple, but <laughs> stop laughing at me. I want to know what ensure means and why is it there? Well, because it's not, you're not performing an operation. You're not saying add Windows feature, right? Because then if you add it and then you try and add it again, you get an error. Right. So what you're saying is, here's this thing, this resource. This is the one I want. And what do you want it? You want it to be sure that it's there or do you want to make sure that it's not there? And see, I think this was a unique conceptual thing because I'm thinking, well, I just, just install. But no, if I want to recheck this and have it reapply, you're right, you can run into error messages, this could not be good. What this is, is this is saying, yeah, I want it, my desire is to have it there. Yep. If it's not there, put it there. If it is there, don't touch it, Yep. kind of thing. Yeah. So now, just to be clear, most of the time you're going to be saying ensure equals present. And so we've talked about making that the default and then only having it if it's not, but um, it's always good to have it there. Yeah, I like to have it in there because I'm that kind of guy. So if you take a look at my configuration, once again, um, it'll ensure it'll be for servers S1, S2. Take a look at the out path. I'm gonna run this configuration, see config name, config name, and put the configuration, which will be one of our MOF files, out to that folder. So I'm gonna run it. Notice it created the MOS for those machines, S1 and S2. They're not the meta MOS. Those were for the local configuration managers. And now it's time to deploy it. Now, I was gonna show everybody that the MOS were out there, but it shows it already on the screen. And here's what I wanna do before we send this out. I'm going to launch Internet Explorer. And yeah. I'm gonna prove, no magic in the box, that there is no web server already out there. So these will fail, unless I have a web server out there. There's S1, and somewhere there's gonna be S2. I don't know where the browser went for the other one. But, uh, oh, I just brought it up for S1 to show everybody that it failed, so I didn't bring it up for S2, but it would. And now we're gonna deploy that configuration. So start DS configuration is a way to send a, con a config to uh, push a config yes. out to a box. Yes. So we're gonna push this config out, the box will, the LCM will take a look at it, and then it'll do whatever it's supposed to do mm -hmm. for it. Now we're gonna run this, we're gonna give it the folder for where the MOFs are located, and then we're gonna tell this to wait and then be verbose. And I want to talk a minute about this wait. If we run start DS configuration without dash wait, it's going to create a PowerShell background job. job. Yeah. It's going to run it in the background yeah. for me. So yeah, I just send off this job in the background. If I want later, I can check on that job with yep. get job in its ID yep. and then see how the job performed. By putting in dash wait, it's not going to do a background job. It's going to do it right in front of us in real time. Exactly. So if you're doing this in a lab environment for testing, you're going to want the dash wait. So let's go ahead and try this. We'll fire it. And it'll send out the configurations. Notice I'm only sending the configuration to S1, not actually S1 and S2, even though I have a config for both, because I want you to see the difference between them. as he sends it out. Happens but pretty when quick. this finishes, I'd like to show them the, the verbose output. Because we yeah. worked to, uh, uh, when you first start using desired state configuration, what you'll do is you'll do exactly this, and then you'll read the, out, read the verbose output. And I encourage you to do that. It'll give you a clue as to what the engine's doing and why it's doing it, et cetera. But then you'll see that it's extremely regularly structured. Okay, so take go back to the beginning. Yeah. Let me go yeah. ahead and uh, bring him up full screen so that we can take a look at the verbose output here. Yeah, so notice there, it's extremely well structured in terms of like lining up on columns. Yeah. So what happens is you'll read this and you'll get, you'll say, okay, I see what it's doing, what it's doing, what it's doing, okay, get that in focus. And then if you, after you read a few of these, what will happen is you stop reading them and you recognize them. So all of a sudden you're just looking for blah, blah, blah. I'm looking for start here. 
I'm looking for skip here. And you can be extraordinarily efficient in parsing through these things uh, because you're not reading it, you're recognizing it. I, I've noticed that myself is that the, the more that you see these, your experience level gets your eyes to go right to the, the correct location, which the structure of this help actually helps with that. So in this, if you, you want to help us read this, we've got a Windows feature that we're going to start with, and it's using a resource. Whoops, it skips up there. Windows feature, and I had called it IIS. Yeah, so the first thing is LCM. So see from the beginning for both, and then it tells you what machine. So S1. S1. So it's not working on S2, it's working on S1. Who's telling you the information? So this is the LCM is telling you. It's going to start the set. It's then going to start the resource. Which resource? Windows feature IIS. It first starts with a test. So it tests this thing. And then it comes back, and now you see it doesn't have the LCM, those next few lines. Right. That's telling you that the, the provider's telling you this information, okay, not the LCM, LCM itself. The LCM gets the document, and then it dispatches it to various pieces of code called providers. That's where they play. Their verbose output shows up here, too. So it says, hey, it started this, it succeeded. Uh, what did it say? And I think Installing in this case, it. you know, it's doing the Get Windows feature. It's looking for web server. Oh, yeah. It's it tested. succeeded um, it, uh, on web server. And so it tested it, okay? And then you see it starts a set. So that's telling you that the test found that it wasn't in the desired state configuration. So now it's gonna set the desired state configuration, okay? So then it tells you what it does. It started the installation, goes through all that. The provider's providing all that. Then the LCM tells you it finished, it ended the set of that resource, and then did it again. Now here, let's, if you don't mind, yeah. let's run it again. And okay. Show the difference. Okay, let's run it again. I like that idea. So, where's my config? Where's my config today? Just, just F8. Oh, there it is. Huh? Yep. What are you doing? And we're gonna no, run. No, 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 no. D just run F8 again. Oh, start just run the. Ah, I yeah. see what you're saying. Yeah. So, just yeah. run start DSC config again. Yeah. So we're gonna apply the configuration again. Okay. No, look at this. Oh, it's look at that. Yeah, it's okay. a lot shorter. It's a lot shorter. So here, again, the starting set, start resource, start test. Okay? And so notice it does the test, and it succeeded, and it comes back and it says skip set. Skip. Skip. And so it's not going to do that because it's in the correct desired state. Now, I want to point something out. What he's just showing us in reading this verbose output is how this process works. And this is going to become paramount especially if you're going to join us tomorrow when we start creating our own custom resources because we have to create this. We're going to test to see if what is necessary or needed is there. If it's there, we're going to do nothing else. We're going to skip setting it. But if it's not there, we need to actually set it or make that change. So it's a test, then a set um, in this. And this is a great example of it configuring it. And then when we ran it again, it's going, I don't need to do anything. Everything's good. And notice no error message. Well, the big question is, is... Did it do it? Did it do it? And so let's uh, go ahead and go back here to the demo. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to have it bring up a browser uh, for both S1 and S2. We did not install it on S2. We did install it on S1 just to show it. Now, the command that I'm using, I'm just going to start process. You, what's the <laughs> alias for this is start? And I'm starting uh, Internet Explorer for both S1 and S2. And I'll bring them up. S2 will fail because there is no web server. We did not send a configuration to it, but look at S1. Dun, da, 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 da. We have a web server. And I want to point out something. It just so happens that I happen to be a web guy. And I know it's not something I, I, I you know, talk a lot about. It's, it's not embarrassing or anything. I'm proud of it, but I'm a web guy. <laughs> Setting up and installing and configuring web servers look at what you just had to know to get a web server working with a default website on port 80. Um, but you had to know the word web server. So the idea of a declarative configuration that is simplified so that you can say, this is what I want, and then the resources understanding and doing the work for you, that's what makes this so powerful, at least one of the things that So does. Jason, what I think few people know is that prior to be starting, when you started becoming a web guy, you had a pretty full-blown mullet. <laughs> It's my, it's my safety dragon. Um, <laughs> I, I did have a mullet back in the day. Um, so 
let's check how we're doing here on our slides. I got more to show you because we want to test this out a little bit further. So we, we just performed the push deployment of deploying uh, an IIS website. We found our resources. We created the configuration and we pushed it out. But you know what? I'm not done yet. I want to test this. So let's go ahead and go back. Let me flip here back to my machine and we'll go back to the script. Jeffrey, I'm going to I'm gonna take this out of a desired state. I'm going to tell it to remove the web server um, and reboot that server. I'm gonna I'm gonna be the guy that walks up to the box. Yeah, you know, I should do this for you. Let me hit F8. I'm always the guy. Oh. <laughs> you gotta, he's gonna come over, he's, so he's gonna be the guy. I, I'm the guy. I'm the guy that like screws it up. Where are we there? Yeah. Yeah, I'm the guy. So. <laughs> And folks, what I'm going to do here really quick is I'm going to see if I can flip to, now this happens so fast, I'm going to see if I can show you the, the, the reboot here. We might catch the message on S1. We might not. In fact, I think it's already rebooted. Sometimes you can catch the message where the computer in this case comes up and basically says, no. Oh, boom. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So the reboot happened a lot faster than on my VM than I had planned for. Here's the deal. The machine actually, when it comes back up, it says it's removing the feature, and then it comes back and says, I could not complete this, con this removal. Hmm. In other words, it's, the LCM runs and it puts it right back in. Let me show you, um, bring back up here. Let's go out, oops, wait a minute, wait a minute. Remove, oh, we had a failure. Access denied. Oh, you know why? I don't. I'll, I'll, I, this is my fault, and we're going to fix it real quick, guys. Um, so we did remove Windows feature, web server. This is removing it on my local machine. That's not cool. So we need to have this removed <laughs> on, on S1. That's like something I would do. <laughs> well, you're the one that pressed F8. I would have thought you would have caught <laughs> oh, this. Oh, I did um, do that. Yeah. So computer name, S1, and we'll... Um, We'll invoke this real quick. And this will give us another shot at trying to see if we can catch the restart. So I'll press F8. It's invoking it. Let me go down here and see if we can catch it real quick. We might catch it as it reboots him. He's going to, we might catch the message. It might be a little too fast, but we'll see. Yeah, that darn Windows Server is just too fast. Well, <laughs> that's such a problem. Know, I've been meaning to speak to you about that. Yeah. You know, that darn Windows Server is too fast. Have you actually gotten any complaints about the speed of Server 2012 being too fast? I mean, it is really fast because in core. Well, no, actually, we did. Cool. We did have to do that. You know, that there were some um, things in the. Well, actually, it was I think 2012 and Windows 8, that it rebooted too quickly, so we had to, you know, because people, like you have to hit F8 to yeah, get the F8, BIOS. Yeah. It rebooted too quickly, so they couldn't, they weren't doing that, and they had to introduce some experience to, say, reboot into that. Uh, see, I love that. And in our case, it rebooted too quickly. So what we're going to do is take a look at the script, and let's see here. Now, we, rem we uh, removed that feature. That means that this was no longer in the state that we had wanted it. Success, true, restart, yes. And yeah. so what I'm going to do is see if we can catch it real quick before the uh, LCM fixes it. Nope, it already fixed it. I was hoping to catch it fast enough where it was broke before it got returned to our desired state. And it did get returned to our desired state, even after the remove. In fact, we'll run a test DSC configuration. And wow, this thing, this server is so fast. Um, and I'm not sure why, he may still be kind of coming back up for this. Yeah. Um, so we're, you know, some things are moving really quick. But as you so can let's tell. Just, let's just uh, recap what happened there. So we set the desired state configuration to say this machine should have a web server and should be running. We showed that it did. Then we showed, you know, Somebody went and messed with it. They removed it. Uh, and when it rebooted, uh, one of the first things that happens is desired state configuration gets invoked and says, hey, before we go farther, make sure the uh, configuration is the way it should be. And so it detects, wait, we're supposed to have a web server? Don't have a web server. Install the web server. Make it so. Jason didn't have to do anything. The system uh, is set up to do it that way. And in fact, Jason didn't not only didn't have to do anything, the system did it so fast, Jason couldn't show you it in a broken state. Now, normally, you'd be able to catch that. And so if you're trying this and you're following along and, and you're trying it out too, see if you can catch it. 
um, when it's not in its desired state and then as it decides to, as it comes back into its desired state where the web server gets reinstalled. And I did all of that with never actually having to go to the box to fix the issue. And so now I've managed both Drift and we've sent out that document. Now, Jeffrey, just to kind of recap, because now that we've shown them a, a simple push in some of the configuration documents, yep. we're going to move on and show them how to make pull servers and, and the, the big stuff for okay. the scale. Yeah. But as, as just as a quick recap, we showed them that you write it, you write configurations in PowerShell. Yes. Don't have to learn a different language. You right. kept your promise. We love that. It's really not bad. It's just like making a function. Yep. So it's a simple structure to write it in. We write configurations for the LCM to configure that local configuration manager. That's the meta MOF yep. that got created. We create configurations then for what we want our desired state to be for the machine. Exactly. And we can push those and send those out. And then the machines will go into their desired state, which we did and awfully quickly. Totally awesome. Try the code because you want to kind of have these concepts in mind because when we come back, we're going to switch out of having a push setup. Now we're going to go into what you would usually do in your environment and create a pull setup. The complexity is going to get increased, not only because we have different pull options, because we're going to have to start doing some interesting things with the names of the configuration documents. But we'll talk about all of that and much more when we come back. But before oh, yes. we go, before we go on, again, oh, responding yeah. to customers, uh, there's been a lot of customers uh, asking in the, in the forums about uh, products uh, layered on top of this. So currently, in particular, System Center. And ah, so currently, okay. uh, we don't talk about the future stuff, but I can just say this. Uh, you know, this is a desired state configuration management platform. Uh, and the currently announced products that are supporting desired state configuration are three. There's, by the way, there's many others that we're having conversations with. People are very excited about it, but the three that are, are very public about it are one, Chef's product. Uh, they've been uh, very forward. Uh, next is a product called uh, Guardrail from Script Rock. Script Rock, yeah. Great Absolutely. stuff. Absolutely. And then a product uh, from Aditi called Brewmaster. So those are the three products. And then in terms of System Center, you know, watch that space. System Center has historically had products in this space, but uh, there's nothing that they've announced. And there's nothing that they've announced. Uh, but as a thinking man, I've got to think that something's going to happen, right? I would think. I don't know. I don't know. Okay, I haven't talked to him about any of this. He wouldn't tell me anyways, but I don't know. I'm just saying I would think. Also, something that's really interesting, if you are joining us for both days, and we'll talk about the second day as we start to wrap up today, um, at some point, someone by the name of Stephen Morosky is going to be in, and he's a DSC expert, and he's working with chefs. So if you have chef questions and how their products work with this platform, he'll be the guy as well. So anyways, when we come back, we're going to go into setting up pool servers, scale this up, and show you how to write configs for the masses. So see you when we return.